Hello, my friends. I'm Don Chapman. I'm your host here on Origins. We're so delighted you've joined us today. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We have a tremendous guest with us today. Dr. Russell Humphreys is here. Dr. Humphreys, how good to have you. It's really good to be here. Now, you and I have had an opportunity to do several shows together, but today we're going to talk about starlight and time. And this is a subject where you have invested a great deal of your time, isn't it? Yes, it is. In fact, you've written a book in this area. Yes. And uh, so talk to us about starlight and time. What, uh, what are we, what are we, where are we going today with this show? Well, we're going to the edge of the universe wow. with some uh, things that the Bible tells us, us that we will find there that hardly anyone has noticed uh, in the scriptures. But you have to do this to understand cosmology. If we're going to believe the Bible, we have to believe every line of the Bible, that this yes. is God's word. So yes. little phrases... Uh, become very big deals when they give us scientific hints, don't they? That's right. And one hint is that there are waters, it says, at the edge of the universe. And uh, there's a scripture for that. Uh, Praise him, sun, moon, and stars. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. And so with the, your scientific mind, you know, I'm just going to emphasize the praise him, but you're saying this is information that there is waters above the heavens. Yes, and water, like all other material, has weight, has mass. Now, and I believe that because I believe the Word of God, but is there any scientific evidence that there's waters above the heavens? There's indirect evidence, and we'll get to that. Okay. There, it makes some sense of some scientific mysteries. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the, uh, the clue that uh, we're on to something here. Uh, we have a young universe according to scripture. And uh, you may remember Stephen Hawking here. Uh, this I, I do know fellow. Dr. Hawking, know of Dr. Hawking. Okay. He's, uh, heart. He wrote a, a famous book called Brief History of Time. It's a good book. And, uh, but uh, because we have a much younger universe than Dr. Hawking is picturing, we need a different thing. So keep your eye on the animation up here. We need a history of brief time. <laughs> that's right. And that's why this is important. A good biblical cosmology should explain a number of things. One is how the light from very distant parts of the cosmos got here fast. And uh, another is the near and far galaxy similarity. That's a big contrast uh, between these cosmologies and what the Big Bang would predict. Uh, Big Bang is in trouble on that area. And uh, we'll talk about the red shifts of light from distant galaxies, and all cosmologies need to explain that because it's a basic feature of what we see. And I'll talk about more what that is. And then uh, a mystery that's been with us a few decades called the pioneer anomaly or the pioneer effect, and I'll explain what that is. Okay. All of that's coming up on today's show. Yes. Well, we better get to it. So, all right. Let's uh, explain how those waters above the heavens got here. And uh, so I'm saying, I'm pointing out some scripture here that the heavens originated in water. Uh, you remember uh, that, uh, that God said there was, there was uh, the Spirit of God was moving above the, the face, face of the waters yes. and there was darkness before that, he said, darkness yes. on the face of the deep. And then he said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Note that word midst. And there is an expanse. An expanse is something that will be spread out. And the Hebrew word means something spread out or stretched out. So I'm going to run a little animation here with the, this ball of waters that I'm picturing, uh, that God made everything as water first. But down near the middle of this, there's this thing, this uh, empty space, and there are waters below that empty space and waters above the empty space, but we're going to run an expansion. Okay. So we have waters above the expanse. Here are the waters above, and there are waters below the expanse, and those waters, remember, started in the midst. That's also important. And you're saying the water expands clear beyond the universe where we know it. Yes, billions of light years, because it has to be big enough for the stars. Remember right. those waters uh, that were above the heavens. This uh, isn't just an expanse for the atmosphere around the Earth, but no. for the whole 
of the universe. Yes, and okay. uh, Genesis says God placed the stars in the expanse or in the firmament of the heavens. So, uh, and he called this expanse heavens or heaven. It's very important to know that the earth is near the center. I'm not saying it's exactly at the center, but he said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And then that dry land on the third day uh, is part of the, the whole planet earth. So this thing that started off in the midst of the waters has now uh, become the earth. God transformed it. At the start of the fourth day of creation, the earth was the only matter, the only stuff uh, that was below the waters above the heavens. And uh, that makes for an unusual gravity situation. And now I'm going to switch to an analogy, which I'll refer to throughout the whole program, which I think will help people understand. And the analogy is a good one. Uh, it uh, reflects the math good, but it's a trampoline. Okay. You see this girl here? I do. You see down here what's happened to the trampoline that she's standing on? It dents down. It, it, press, it dents. It's her pushed weight down has, by her weight. It's pushed down right. that trampoline. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, compare, and it's a good comparison, uh, space to a fabric. All Scripture right. talks about space as if it's a stuff. And I talk about this in my book, Starlight and Time. It's a, it's a material that we can't perceive. And, uh, and mass, like the girl there, makes a dent in that stuff. So uh, now let's go back to the, the waters above and think what they would do to our trampoline. The waters above are like a, a heavy ring sitting on the trampoline. So you see this heavy, imagine it made of lead or something. It flattens out the, uh, the trampoline inside the ring, but the, uh, it's made a dent in the whole trampoline. And that's just exactly what Newton's equations and Einstein's equations say happens with gravity. Uh, so, Okay. Now, those waters above are pretty massive, as it turns out. They, they're, uh, they make a deep dent. So here's a picture of the dent. And the vertical dimension, we can talk about it as being gravitational energy. That, that's how much energy it would take to haul a mass from the flat part all the way out, as f way above all the matter of the universe, well beyond the, the waters above the universe. Uh, that energy is a lot while you're down in the dent, but it's not much when you're way out here. So the water's made a big dent, and I know that from some other things we'll talk about when we get to the pioneer effect, but the water mass is 20 times all the mass of all the galaxies of stars that the Hubble Space Telescope can see. So they made a deep dent. Wow. Now this leads to another thing. Let's take a cross section of this trampoline now. All right. And I'll show it to you there. So here's distance out from where the Earth is here out to way beyond the waters above. And here are the waters above. They're like that ring on the trampoline making a, a deep dent. But uh, some peer reviewed, uh, we'll talk about that later, uh, articles that I've done that have gone through peer review uh, show that uh, there's a, a depth to that dent below which there is no time, nothing happens. All processes stop. It's dark, light doesn't travel very dull place. <laughs> and, uh, and the earth would be just above that dent, according to, to uh, the main part of my theory. And, and so, uh, so it's just about at the depth where interesting things happen, or maybe dull things, since it's no time. So, so if the dent were any deeper, time would stop wow. for any part of the fabric. Because the fabric uh, of space itself depends on this energy, this gravitational energy, and when it gets b uh, more than to a greater than a certain amount, uh, light cannot pass through it, nothing can happen. Um, waves can't travel in it, so it's just a, uh, so it's the, a result of the gravitational energy uh, of the waters above. This is really fascinating. It's unlike 
anything we've ever done. You're, you're saying to us that space is not just the absence of matter, but in mm -hmm. fact, we need to think of space as a fabric yes. uh, that it, 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 it's just we can't perceive the matter it's made of. Have I got that right? That's exactly right. And the water has dented it, yeah, it and it shows that time is relative because uh, yes. if the dent were any deeper, time would stop. That's right. I'm just making sure I'm hearing yes. you. This, this is kind of new stuff to this us. This is new stuff. <laughs> That's this is right. a new kind of gravitational time dilation. Yeah. Uh, Einstein's theories of relativity talk about time dilation, time stretching, various kinds. This is a new kind. And this has been through peer review, and it's a new solution of Einstein's equations. So you and Einstein are working from the same, uh, drinking yeah. from the same well here. Yeah, this is, this yeah. is not uh, new physics, or let me put it this way. It's, it's got the same foundation. It's just I've developed the physics further in this direction than anyone else has gone. And like a good scientist, you have taken these theories that uh, all have basis in physics, and you have... Uh, given them over as you have written them up to other physicists and they have done what we call peer review mm -hmm. and to say this isn't just your fascination your imagination uh, this uh, ha can uh, withstand the scrutiny of other physicists saying yes this is sound logic yeah now at the end of the show I'll mention uh, uh, a journal where people can uh, physicists can find the equations and find the peer-reviewed uh, work so, okay, the Earth was just above this timeless level. Okay. Let's see what happens with that. Uh, well, we have another thing to think about. Uh, during the fourth day, God created the stars. And I'm going to, in this animation, picture them as God making them in a wave, a spherical wave traveling out from the Earth. That's not essential, but just okay. I'll run that animation again. Here, the green dot in the center here is the Earth, and God is making the galaxies, each right. of those is galaxies, all the way out to the waters above, empty space beyond the waters above. So that has an effect on our trampoline. The new star masses, the masses, that material would dent the trampoline some more. Sure. So I'm going to run a little animation here. Uh, look at the, the dent. As the wave of new stars is made, it makes a dent. Push and it down further. Uh, with the way I pictured it, the dent would be a straight line in cross-section. So that's a linear, a line dent. Uh, so this has some effects because remember that timeless zone? Mm -hmm. uh, we've now dropped part of the trampoline below the timeless zone. But then after all of this happens, God was stretching out the heavens like a tent curtain. So God stretched out the fabric of space, making this nearly flat region rise up. So here's one of 17 verses in scripture that talks about God stretching out the heavens like a tent curtain. Yes, wow. And so I'm gonna watch, watch our cross section of the trampoline now as God stretches out the heavens, see what happens. The, the dent in the trampoline gets shallower, it gets pulled up. Okay, just like the weight comes up yeah. off it and then... So if you tightened up the trampoline right. with something, uh, okay. the, the ring would not be as deep. Makes sense, okay. Okay. So, let's go back to our timeless situation. That stretching raises the dent back up above the timeless level. So, I'll run the animation here with the timeless level in place. You see that that dent, parts of it come up first. I'll run it again parts of the dent come up first near here, and then later on where the earth is, the earth is the last thing to rise above that dent, or above that timeless level. So now, all of this is graphs, and I know a lot of people uh, have problems with graphs. So I'm going to run a simulation uh, just to show, show you how it would look if you were looking at the universe from God's point of view All right. um, in cross-section. Uh, and uh, the point will be that t this wave of timelessness followed the wave of new stars. So uh, we're going to start in the center, and there's God making the new stars. But you, did you notice a wave of blackness behind the new stars? Let's run that again. Uh, so right here in the center, God has already dented that trampoline enough to drop the earth into the timeless zone, and okay. it's black in the timeless zone. Nothing is, nothing is happening there. Right. 
But now God is going to make the, the wave of stars, new stars, and behind it will follow this black area, this wave of, of timelessness. Then that black area will rebound uh, from the waters above and shrink back to nothing, and then you'll see a green dot, which is the earth that appears. And so let's just run it again. There's the okay. wave. There's the There's black, black thing. Now the black thing is shrinking. Now the earth and has popped out there. As the stars pop back out behind the wave of timelessness when it's shrinking, their light is following that wave in Ah, there. so there's where the light starts. Yeah, and that, if that wave is, the timeless zone is shrinking at the speed of light, then the light follows right behind that timeless zone, that sphere of, of blackness. And as soon as the earth uh, pops out and the timeless zone disappears, that light is already right there. That's amazing. I've never heard anything like this. It's fascinating. It almost scares me that it makes sense. Uh, that, uh, You're as crazy as me you know, now. It, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible thought. You know, the stars were made. Yes. This timeless sphere expanded. Right. Everything was in it, and then it, the timeless sphere rebounded. And right. New galaxies started appearing. Their, some of their light follows that timeless zone in. Back in. Finally, the timeless zone shrinks to nothing. The Earth pops back out. But all the time the Earth is in the timeless zone, there's nothing happening. So no time is ticking at all here that's on Earth. If, that's if you had been here on the night side of the Earth, the sky would have been black for a while. And then there would be some instant when suddenly, boom, you see everything there. Wow. <laughs> all the stars, all the galaxies. Wow. So uh, the point is that the fourth day of creation was only an ordinary 24 hour day, but it was here. Out in the rest of the universe, there was more time that elapsed. But as measured by clocks here, uh, the whole universe is young. So that starlight arrived during the fourth day. So way out there, it's, it, there could be light years, but here it was 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. So you remember in Genesis, he said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light on the earth. Right. Now, other things he said, and then, and it was so. So that starlight arrived on the fourth day of creation. Yeah. And this is a way, a possible way, that uh, it, God could have done it. So. That, this is so amazing. We've got to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the galaxies. If this is true, then the distant galaxies have to be the same age as what's close to us. And we'll see if that verifies. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The Eyes Lens, a marvel of chemistry. Our Eyes Lens is truly a marvel of chemistry. It contains a very high concentration of protein molecules in a transparent water solution. This discovery amazed scientists because protein molecules are not transparent, but opaque. In the lens, they pack together like the molecules of a window glass. This results in the normally opaque protein solution becoming transparent. When it comes to the eye, Creation makes sense while evolution leaves us questioning its logic. We're back with Dr. Russell Humphreys and we're talking about starlight and time. We've just had an incredibly fascinating theory that he has put forth. We have some evidence because of Hubble and uh, how does it fit in with your theory? It fits in very well and it explains some, uh, a big mystery that the Big Bang is having problems with that nobody's talking about. And that is the fact that uh, distant galaxies look like nearby galaxies. And this is a picture from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Telescope that is looking way out there. Here's, here's one galaxy that's a little closer to us, um, and you can see that it looks like a spiral, and all of these little specks on the picture are galaxies of 100 billion stars apiece. Wow. We're looking very deep into God's universe here. But the point is that as deep as we look, all of those galaxies look very much like the galaxies that are nearby us. According to the Big Bang, we should be seeing those galaxies as they're younger and younger, closer and closer to the Big Bang, and they should be much less developed, but they don't. They look just as well developed out there as they do here. And you're saying the reason they look developed is they were all made on the same they day. They were all made on the same day, and we're seeing them <laughs> the as that is there for timeless that. zone shrank. Uh, so we're, this theory says they should look like this. All right. The Big Bang says something quite different. So that's a piece of evidence. Yes, sir. Now, uh, we need to talk about the redshift of distant galaxies. Here we have a light wave 
in the fabric of space as God is okay. stretching it out, stretches out the heavens like a tent curtain. It stretches out the wavelength, you see. Uh -huh. I'll just run that animation again. Here we have short wavelength, but as the fabric of space is stretched out, as this light was traveling towards us, space was being stretched out, and that makes a redshift. Now, what's a, a redshift? Let me just show you a spectrum that a, an astronomer would see, and the black lines in the spectrum are from atoms, hydrogen atoms, and those shift to the red as you look deeper and deeper into space. So I'll run a little animation just to see how a spectrum would look as we could look at a source that was getting further and further from us. So you see those black lines moving toward the right, right. toward the red side. That's the red shift. So uh, now the stretching of space explains a, a mystery called the Pioneer Anomaly. Uh, the Pioneer spacecraft you see here, nice artist's conception of it, is way beyond the solar system. Over here is the solar system. It's way out there. And uh, the two Pioneer spacecraft plus two other now pretty distant spacecraft are slowing down more than they should, more than gravity can account for. And that's been a mystery for two decades, but this stretching of space and the getting shallower of, the, of that dent in space-time uh, that we showed in the first part, as that dent gets shallower and shallower, it affects the fabric of space itself and affects how fast radar pulses can move back and forth between the solar system and the Pioneer. And that accounts for the Pioneer effect. And this is in uh, uh, the Journal of Creation, uh, which you can find at creation.com. Uh, the August 2007 has not only the Pioneer anomaly um, explained by this theory, but the basic groundwork for this whole cosmology. I solved a new equation, I found a new solution of Einstein's equations. And for those who love math, uh, you can wade through 62 equations in the appendix of that. My goodness. <laughs> but that's the foundation of all of this cosmology. Okay. Dr. Humphreys, I just need to say to you as we wrap up our show today how deeply I appreciate how seriously you take the Word of God and that you do your scientific research, your physics, based on the truth that you find in Scripture. And when you do that, when you start in the right place, you find incredible answers that take science and validate Scripture with them instead of seeing this conflict between science and Scripture. And uh, when you do that, you do a great service to the Word of God and to the church. And we're uh, so thankful you. for you. that and for your work. You know, my friends, I think that science is something that Christians need to do and they need to understand. And I hope those of you with a scientific inclination will have looked carefully at what Dr. Humphreys has said today. Don't be afraid to do research, to dig deep, to look for the truth, but always do it understanding that God's Word will prove true. You know, no matter what we say or where we go, there's one truth I want you to hang on to as we study all of these scientific truths together. Never forget it's God's view that He created you. And that should be your world, you too. Thanks for joining us on Origins today. I hope you'll join us again soon. And until then, God bless you, my friend.